This week, is Freemasonry too easy to join? We'll read part four of Darren Laners' expose on Whither Are We Traveling? A new generational look at the original 1963 paper. Is everything geared for speed? Is proficiency something we still need? Then we'll take a trip into the future with illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison as he attends a lodge meeting, but this time something's a little different. Then we'll take a look at that old saying, know thyself. How does it apply in a world that continually changes? And as it changes, so do we. Does knowing thyself require a constant look introspectively? Finally, we'll wrap it up with a single card tarot draw and we'll explore what it could mean for us in our lives in a practical sense. All this and more, stay tuned. Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back. This is episode number 533. I want to thank our producers, fellows, contributors, and legacy partners for bringing the Whence Came You podcast to the world since July of 2011. All of the production and the add-ons and the little segments that we do and the things that we incorporate into the show like music and sounds and all of this is thanks to those people who support the show. And the more support we get, the bigger we can make the show and the better the production value and all of those things. We're just trying to keep on top of everything and make sure that this program stays contemporary and enjoyable throughout time and doesn't become stale. So uh, if you are out there and you're thinking, how can I help? Then head on over to WCYpodcast.com and click on support the show. So the first thing that I want to mention this week is I just got back from Masonic Week, which is hosted by the Allied Masonic Degrees, and it was pretty incredible. We had a great time. There was uh, lots to do, lots of networking opportunities uh, to for Masons from around the country. I mean, this is a national meeting, uh, the longest-running Masonic educational degree conference in North America. It's pretty fantastic. So I do encourage everybody to head out there and check it out. Now, while I was there, I became aware of something that is pretty amazing also. I have to mention the Philolathes Society, of which I am a member of Alphonse Serza chapter. The Philolathes Society is the oldest Masonic scholarly magazine in the North American continent, and they do a Masonic journal, which comes out quarterly. This year, their quarterly meeting had Brother James Morgan, who presented. Uh, he did a fantastic job. But the thing I want to mention is that the journal has a new subscription model I don't think it's totally on the website yet, but they did give a pamphlet about it. They're doing lodge memberships, very similar to the way that the Southern California Research Lodge's Fraternal Review does a lodge subscription. The lodge subscription for Philolathes, very similar to the way the Southern California Research Lodge does the Fraternal Review's lodge subscription, the Philolathes has launched something very similar or will be launching something very similar. So I do recommend you checking out the website, philolathes.com. That's P-H-I-L-A-L-E-T-H-E-S.com. I'll have a link to it in the show notes for you to check it out. Now, over the last few weeks, we've been having a lot of interviews, beginning with illustrious brother Frank Conway to talk about the Masonic pageant, and then we had brother Angel Millar on to talk about the Fraternal Review and his new gig this year being the uh, editor-in-chief. And then we just had an episode with uh, my good friend and brother here in Illinois, Jordan Kelly. But we left off on something very important, which is a multi-part series that we are covering called Whither Are We Traveling? by Worshipful Brother Darren A. Laners. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar, essentially uh, Darren has been covering a piece by Dwight L. Smith, and we'll talk about that at the beginning of the piece, which has some lengthy quotes from the actual publication. But I want to get right into that right now. Whither Are We Traveling? Part 4 As we continue to explore Dwight L. Smith's seminal work, Whither Are We Traveling? 
we begin to explore his answers to the 10 questions he posed for self-examination of the state of ancient craft Freemasonry in 1963. The question he asked are as important and relevant now as they were then. This week, we look at question three. Has Freemasonry become too easy to obtain? Now I should mention before we begin, if you want to catch up, then you're gonna wanna check out episode 527, 528, and 529. Let's continue. Most Worshipful Brother Smith begins this section with the following. Some three months ago, when this series of articles was introduced, I took advantage of a 50-year presentation occasion to write a Masonic editorial. The recipient of the award of gold had petitioned a Southern Indiana Lodge in 1911 when he was making $10 a week as an apprentice printer. The fee for the degrees was $20. He thought enough of Freemasonry to empty his pay envelope twice. A century ago, it was not uncommon for men to pay what amounted to a month's wages to become a Mason. We know without challenge that today petitioners are paying a fee which represents a week's wages at most, sometimes only two or three days." End quote. For some context, the spending power of $10 in 1911 is $291.15 in 2021 when calculated for inflation. The highest dues I pay for my Blue Lodge membership is $70 annually. When I calculate the other lodge I belong to, I pay $105 in Blue Lodge dues while I pay close to $100 individually for my Shrine and Scottish Rite membership dues. If you add in the other appended body dues, I'm probably paying close to $300 a year for the privilege of membership in them. That's approximately three times the amount I'm paying for Blue Lodge membership, which is required for membership in the rest of these bodies. There is something wrong with this picture. Smith agrees. Quote, and when we compare the ridiculously low fees paid to an ancient craft lodge with the aggregate fees paid to other Masonic bodies and appended groups, we begin to see clearly what is wrong. Men are willing to pay for the privilege of Freemasonry, but we distribute the fee they should be paying to an ancient craft lodge among all the relatives, the in-laws, and stepchildren. We place such a cheap value on the basic degrees that it is no wonder newly raised Masons end up having little or no respect for the symbolic lodge. He continues, quote, Before we are in a position to tackle some of the difficulties that beset us, we must reestablish the premise that Freemasonry is a pearl of great price, worth a great deal of effort, great deal of sacrifice, a great deal of waiting to obtain. We need to do a little preaching, perhaps, with a certain New Testament passage as the text, quote, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Has Freemasonry become too easy to obtain? I am one who believes that it has. And I am not the only one. My old friend Arthur H. Strickland of Kansas recently wrote a thoughtful article for the Philalethes entitled, Who Killed Cock Robin? Calling attention to the old axiom that what is easy to get is not much appreciated he observes that we have done everything that we can think of to cheapen masonry. We have cheapened the fraternity to a point that it is seriously reacting against us. Do I agree? Yes. End quote. Do I agree? Yes. I believe that this question goes hand in hand with the last article in the series where I examine Smith's work. How well are we guarding the West Gate? When we are, in fact, not upholding standards for membership, then we have essentially made Freemasonry as available to everyone as the prize at the bottom of a cereal box. One only needs to buy the box, turn it upside down, and open it to find the treasure. Smith continues, Has Freemasonry become too easy to obtain? To me, the question is not even debatable. For example, one, our fees for the degrees are so low as to constitute an insult to the fraternity. When I petitioned for the degrees in 1933, the fee was $20. That was a good size chunk of anybody's money in 33, but I would have paid three times that amount. Our economic standards of today can hardly be compared to 1933, yet the minimum fee in Indiana is still only $30. And one lodge in five charges the absolute minimum. There is not a lodge in Indiana whose fee should not be at least twice its present amount. For a long time, I've had the uneasy suspicion that the period of ascent on the quantity rather than quality may have started during those cut rate years of 1933 to 44, when the minimum fee was only $20." End quote. 
To put things into perspective, $20 in 1933 equates to $427.61 in 2021. However, many lodges have not adjusted their dues or degree fees for inflation. Even $30 in 1963, when this work was originally published, equates to $272 in 2021. The two lodges I belong to have degree fees of $150 and $130 respectively. Let's be honest though, for many people, even that represents a large amount of money. Case in point, we have a candidate at one of my lodges. He is in his early 20s. He has a newborn baby and his wife to take care of. He petitioned our lodge to join. He was investigated and he was elected to receive the degrees in masonry. From us initially meeting him to his election was a period of four months. He kept showing up at our meals prior to our business meetings. He spoke to me personally at length about the lack of positive male role models in his life. He essentially has been on his own since the age of 16. I felt compelled to volunteer to be his intender. Different jurisdictions might have different term for this. This is essentially the brother who helps the candidate learn his catechisms for each degree and helps answer any questions they have. Upon speaking to him, I was shocked to find out that no one had spoken with him about degree fees. While the candidates said that he felt there would be no trouble in getting the fees together, I also could tell from the things he had said to me that I believed that not to be the case. I personally could not justify charging him the fee when that money could be going towards diapers, food, and other living expenses to help his newborn and young wife. So I made a decision. I went to the lodge, I explained the situation, and several of us passed the hat to cover his degree fees. My point is, we are personally taking a chance on this young man because I see potential in him. So while I agree with most worshipful brother Smith that degree fees should be adjusted to meet today's standards, I also believe that money shouldn't be the determining factor in whether someone is worthy of being a Freemason. The determining factor should always be the character of the individual petitioning the lodge, not the amount in their bank account. I believe that we need to do a better job of explaining the degree fees to our prospective members, but also be flexible in allowing them to pay those fees. Smith then continues with the following, quote, everything is geared to speed, as if a deadline had to be met. Freemasonry is no longer worth waiting for, nor working for, nor sacrificing for. Too often, it is only a badge of respectability, a prestige symbol, to be obtained with the same hurry-up zeal that would be assumed in acquiring a Cadillac or a yacht. Candidate A must be rushed through the degrees before he leaves for service in the armed forces. He had heard it might be helpful to him. Candidate B must be rushed through because he is about to move to a distant point to take a new job. Candidate C must hurry through so he can join a class in some other organization. Proficiency? Nonsense. A friendly coach can take care of that. Comprehension of the underlying philosophy of Freemasonry, its symbolism and ethics and traditions, what it is and what it seeks to do? You know the answer to that question as well as I. And we not only permit such a situation, we actually encourage it. How in heaven's name can we so cheapen ancient craft Freemasonry and expect anything other than contempt for the parent body? End quote. I recently wrote an article about a candidate at St. Joseph Lodge number 970 that took several years to complete his journey from entered apprentice to master mason. I agree completely with Dwight. We need to slow down. In foreign jurisdictions, it is my understanding that this is the case. Men often spend a few years between their initiation to entered apprentice being passed to the degree of fellow craft and then being raised to the sublime degree of master mason. However, in the States, we push men through the degrees. I'm not even going to discuss one-day classes here. While ultimately it's the quality of the man who is joining that is going to determine what type of Freemason he is going to be versus how quickly he progresses through the degrees, I believe that we are doing both a huge disservice by rushing them through. I believe that the ultimate reasons for this are twofold. One. I believe that grand jurisdictions influence this directly or either indirectly. In many grand jurisdictions, there is a report which shows how many lodges have candidates in progress and the amount of time they have been in progress. The grand secretary, or whomever else is the keeper of the report, 
sends the report out to the area deputy grandmasters, who in turn sends it out to their assistant area deputy grandmasters, who in turn sends it out to the district deputy grandmasters, who in turn then does with it what he wants. In many cases, the stigma of being on a list or report is an impetus to force action by the offending lodge to move the candidate along to the next degree. In many cases, the mentor or intender is then pressured to make sure the candidate's catechism is ready to be given in open lodge, to force the candidate and the intender into a position where the candidate is not learning the work but memorizing the words. They also have an obsession with numbers. We all have seen the charts which show Freemasonry's membership numbers dropping. We have read the articles and heard the cries that we need to replenish the membership or else Freemasonry will die. It's all poppycock. However, it seems that every Grand Lodge feels that it needs to plug the holes in the dike, hold Grand Masters festivals and make Freemasonry easy to obtain. Instead of focusing on the quality of the membership that they are bringing in, we seem to get the message that quantity matters more. So then we lament why we can't get more men attending the meetings when the answer is quite clear. We've brought the wrong men into the fraternity to begin with. 2. Appended body membership qualifications should be changed to stop making membership in them easy to obtain. There are very few invite-only bodies in Freemasonry. Many of the bodies only require one only be a Master Mason to join them. I bore witness to this when I joined the Shrine this past September. The class I joined, the Shrine, was all from the Grand Masters Festival. Here, I am a three-time past master who was Master Mason for, well, almost ten years, joining an appended body with one-hour-old Master Masons. There's something fundamentally wrong with this. So inevitably, what happens is that many of these men never show up to their mother lodge. While they have to pay their dues to keep their membership in the appended bodies, their financial support pales in comparison with the participation. So what I propose is this. There should be at least a five-year waiting period before any Master Mason should be able to join any appendant body. Furthermore, the Master Mason should be attending Lodge at least 80% of the time during this five-year period. And finally, the 80% attendance should be enforced as judiciously as the man needing to pay dues to his mother Lodge going forward for them to continue their membership in the appendant bodies. I'll allow you to pull your jaw off the floor. In the past, Masons needed to be either a Knight Templar or a Scottish Rite Freemason to join the Shrine. Why do Grand Lodges think so little of Blue Lodges to not stand up for them when it comes to the appended bodies? If a Grand Lodge were to say to an appended body, from now on, if you want to be recognized in our jurisdiction, we are redefining what we mean by good standing. Instead of it being only a member being current on their dues, how about adding other qualifications like lodge attendance? In my mind, the members in good standing in my lodge are the ones that keep showing up and running the lodge, not the ones staying at home but paying their dues. Do you think the appendant bodies are going to pull up stakes and leave that jurisdiction? Before you give me any argument about appendant bodies collapsing because they couldn't get any new membership, I would argue that all of the men that already joined will have been grandfathered in. Secondly, in making membership in them harder to obtain, would we also not be raising the quality of their bodies? It boggles my mind that many think of Blue Lodge as being an afterthought instead of the focus of their Masonic journey. It's time for Grand Lodges to stand up and put their foot down when it comes to the qualifications for membership for the appended bodies. Otherwise, why bother with even having the Blue Lodges? If we are allowing them to be a Master Mason factory only for the sake of those Master Masons to be able to join appendant bodies, then we've not only lost the word, but also what the foundation of Freemasonry is and has always been. The Blue Lodge. What happens to a house without a solid foundation? I believe that Dwight would agree with me. He continues, quote, The privilege of courtesy work has been so abused that it actually has become a detriment to all Freemasonry. What was once intended as an occasional pleasant arrangement for the benefit of a lodge has been liberalized to the point that it is now only for the convenience of a candidate. Do you realize that a candidate for the three degrees may become a Master Mason without ever having attended a single meeting of the lodge which has elected him? 
He can be initiated in one jurisdiction, passed in another, and raised in another. And yet we expect him to become a loyal and devoted mason with a strong sentimental attachment to a lodge he knows nothing about, and which has done nothing except to elect him. We crave his faithful attendance, but we do about everything in our power to create a situation in which loyalty has no place. The incident in Montana, in which a brother received his 50-year button without ever having attended a meeting of his own lodge, is not as far-fetched as we would like to think. We can learn a great deal from our Mother Grand Lodge of England and from the jurisdictions of Scotland and Ireland, Austria, Australia, and Canada, where a candidate must receive the entered apprentice degree in the lodge that elected him and in no other. It was a sad day for masonry in Indiana when that regulation was repealed." End quote. I believe that courtesy work, like everything, has a time and a place. If we are serious about slowing down the rate in which the entered apprentice is passed to the degree of fellowcraft and then raised to the sublime degree of a master mason, then there should be no reason to ever have courtesy work except in rare occasions like the one in my article above. But in having a regulation that states that the candidate must receive the entered apprentice degree in the lodge that elected him and in no other, we are doing something that I heard a bunch of district deputy grandmasters complain about just yesterday, which is forcing those lodges to learn the ritual and to confer their own degrees. You see, the major failing of Freemasonry is a lack of accountability. There is nothing holding the lodge accountable for the quality of its work. I heard all of this wailing about sloppy work, yet how can the DDGM really hold a lodge accountable short of threatening to yank a lodge's charter? What really can be done? Like everything else in Freemasonry, we need men that are willing to separate the wheat from the chaff. We need enough men to stand up at Grand Lodges that don't have them support changes to the Constitution and bylaws to allow a minimum standard of certification for wardens to meet before they are allowed to become masters. We also need to have more roadblocks in place that force lodges to exhaust all other options before having candidates go to another lodge to receive courtesy degree work. Dwight then goes on to say, quote, one of the worst offenders in the cheapening process is the well-meaning father who is too eager for his son to become a mason. Those are hard words, but I have seen the story repeated over and over again. Sonny must be pushed through because Pop wants him to join the class in another body, because Pop wants him to receive the degrees in Germany or France or South America. Sonny may not have even lived within the jurisdiction of the Lodge for years and years, but Pop wants him to join if the Lodge has to violate all the rules in the book to accomplish it. So Pop comes to the Grand Lodge office with a plea that the residence laws be set aside, that the period of investigation be waived, that Sonny be advanced without regard to proficiency. You have known him, so have I. His name is Legion. What a contrast to the spirit of that great and good past master of Indianapolis Lodge who waited years upon years to hear his son express the desire to become a mason, and who even then did not offer to pay the son's initiation fee because he wanted the boy to appreciate what he was getting. And then there are the ill-advised church parishioners who pay the fee for their minister. I have met quite a number of those ministers in my day and have become rather cynical after working long hours trying to unravel the record of suspensions for NPD, but I must not get started on that subject." End quote. How many of you have witnessed a son who is a dullard be given the degrees of Freemasonry because their father was a past master and well-respected member of the Lodge? The son barely knew the meaning of own free will and accord before being forced to join the Lodge because of their father's desires. And while as a father I struggle with the idea that my sons will never join Freemasonry, I also realize that in having them do so before they are ready, I am doing a disservice to both them and the craft. If they are never ready, then that's something that I must be prepared to realize. As Dwight ends this section, he puts the best in saying, quote, When we downgrade ancient craft Freemasonry, submit it to all sorts of indignities, look upon it with contempt, label it as something hardly worth mentioning, permit it to have only the crumbs that fall from the table, what can we expect if Master Masons no longer give to their lodges their full measure of loyalty and devotion? End quote. In my next article, I will explore the next question most worshipful Brother Smith poses, question number four. Are we not worshiping at the altar of bigness? Darren A. Laners. Love this piece. It's so funny because as you read Dwight L. Smith's work, 
some people get kind of, well, irritated because a lot of the things that he talks about is considered to be unbrotherly. However, the standard of Freemasonry has dropped and then people join and get used to the new dropped standard and equate that with the way it should be and make all of these kind of excuses about why we can't continue to be the way we were. I very much agree with Brother Lahners in his sentiment about cash money. It's not about cash money, right? It's about actually paying for what the lodge delivers. It's about being financially responsible for a lodge. I'm not a proponent of creating exorbitant dues structures in order to hold back anybody from joining. I am a proponent of creating a dues structure that is realistic, that the members don't have to be assessed or go into the red every year in order to maintain a lodge, which is why I advocate for things like lodges starting up and renting rather than buying and those kinds of things. I mean, even so, my lodge that was formed by myself and Brother Scott Duball and a handful of other brothers, when Scott and I worked on the budget for the lodge, we really looked hard at the dues structure and what it would pay for over years. And we realized a few things. In order to do the things that we wanted, uh, those things are predictable in terms of their cost and their increase of cost over the years. You know, if our lodge is uh, all about bringing in speakers, then we need to pay attention to the market and how much plane tickets cost and how they go up every year or go down. And so those costs are built into the lodge funds, right? And as such, uh, we add in things like our per capita and our rent and all of those other things. And essentially what we come out with is we need at least 27 members paying X amount of dollars each year. And in many cases, you'll find that those minimums, even to rent, so if you own your building, you should be paying even more than this. So if you're renting, then, I mean, uh, if you're charging less than $300 for your dues, plus the per capita, then you're really putting your lodge in a, a bad place. Profit loss statement kind of thing there. I digress, right? This is not what this is really about, but I did want to mention that I agreed with Darren in this point. And, and there really is something to say about upholding the quality of membership so that the quality of membership in the organizations that come along later, like the Shrine or the Scottish New York Rites, you do increase the quality of membership that move into those organizations. Now, those organizations necessarily should be smaller than the Blue Lodges, really. And they always will be because one allows the other to exist. But it should be that the most qualified Masons from Blue Lodge end up in those other organizations so that you end up with top tier bros in those other orgs. And I think that's uh, something that we should think about as well. The point on whether the dad is pushing the young buck to join masonry is interesting because he makes mention in the fourth paragraph or so before the bottom, before the end of the piece, he says, own free will and accord and using the word forced. Isn't this the way it is, right? Uh, even in the, in the book, The Master's Lectures, there is a strong point of saying that, hey, it is absolutely essential that we understand this thing. That is, we are asking our candidates, are you joining of your own free will and accord? And are you uninfluenced by friends, etc.? If your friend comes to you or your dad or whoever and influences you to join, you should not be agreeing to this part of the initiation. You might say no. And they say, well, what do you mean? Well, like, well, my dad asked me and that's kind of influencing, right? Oh, and then they might just continue. But we're lying if we don't agree to this. Right? And this is against our own free will and accord. It wasn't our own choice. I mean, it was, but not until after we had been coerced, maybe. So this happens all the time. For a Craftsman Plus, I want to know, what are your feelings about not particularly dads getting their kids to join, but in general, guys who get their friends to join simply for the benefit that they can now spend more time with their friend? Is that appropriate? And maybe there is a, a case for and against this. 
Like if the guy's really into masonry, then oh, yeah, it's totally appropriate. But I don't think we're talking about that. I think we're talking about somebody who has no idea about what Freemasonry is, somebody who treats it as like blase faire, right? So apathetic, indifferent, or apathetic or indifferent to the entire thing, but want to join because, hey, you know, this is my friend and he's into it. Now I'll go through it for him and check it out. And maybe they derive some value, but it's not like what we're looking for, perhaps. I'd love to know your thoughts on that. We'll have a prompt ready for you in the Craftsman Plus Facebook group. Next, let's get into this week's Masonic Minute with illustrious brother Stephen L. Harris. The Lodge Room looked better than I had ever seen it. Magnificent, actually. The officers' chairs were solid walnut, with gold filigree inlaid designs of the working tools. An Italian marble podium sat in front of each of the warden's chairs with an intricate swirling design that matched the marble insets on the walls around the room. New, deep pile, blue, wall-to-wall carpeting covered the floor. A crystal chandelier illuminated the altar and an ornate letter G hung above the master's chair in the east. I was encouraged by the size of the crowd at the meeting, probably over a hundred brothers. I couldn't help but think how great it was that the Grand Lodge had voted to change things to allow lodges to make every use of the technology available, a move I was certain had everything to do with the large number in attendance. I saw Joe across the room, an old friend and went over to greet him. Wow, I said, I haven't seen you in years. When did you get back here to Liberty, Missouri? I haven't been back to Liberty in years, he replied. Me either, I said, and we chuckled at our little exchange. The master called the meeting to order and we all took our seats. Some things change and some don't. After the opening ceremonies, the secretary read the minutes and the treasurer gave his report. During the business part of the meeting, we discussed the sad state of our lodge furniture, something which seemed inconsistent with the gorgeous view I had of my surroundings. Based on the treasurer's report, we decided we didn't have the funds to do anything about it now but with participation up under the new rules, maybe we could do something next year. The reason I go to meetings these days is the Masonic education, and that meeting did not disappoint. We took a walking tour of Le Lodge des Neuf Sœurs, the Lodge of the Nine Sisters, as it appeared during the time Ben Franklin was a member. Then the main speaker, Brother George Washington, spoke on his thoughts about the fraternity, a presentation based on his writings and experiences during his lifetime. The master closed the lodge and I greeted several more old friends before leaving. Conversing with them after the meeting, we agreed it had been an inspirational evening and would look forward to more of this kind of meetings in the future. A great evening at an end, I popped the virtual reality contact lenses out of my eyes and reacclimated myself as I looked around the stark, empty, virtual reality room surrounding me. I'd really like to go back home and visit that lodge, I said to myself. Gosh, I don't think I've been back there since about 2025. Then I leaned on my walker, and slowly made my way back to my room at my retirement home in Florida. For the Whence Came You podcast, this is Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. What an interesting look at a potential future for Freemasonry. I don't think this is so far off, actually. You know, I think uh, there are already valleys making use of virtual reality, 
and VR use and hologram stuff for reunions. And I don't think this is so far-fetched. It's a rarity to have a Masonic Minute in which uh, Brother Steve looks to the distant future. But of course, it's not too distant. I've heard inclinations of brothers who would want an iPad on a Segway to be their avatar in Lodge to display their face. And, of course, one thinks about things like the series called The Kingsman, in which you put on a pair of glasses and look around the table to see everybody else who is there in remote parts of the world. How far is Freemasonry from something like this? Certainly something to think about. I'll have a link in the show notes to Illustrious Brother Harrison's YouTube channel, as well as the Missouri Lodge of Research, where he was working for a number of years and uh, still continues to work with them in various capacities, publishing books and editing. So our thanks one more time goes out to illustrious Brother Harrison. Thanks so much for this interesting look into a potential future. Next up, let's check out a more philosophical piece. So from time to time, you guys know that we talk a little bit about the Masonic Philosophical Society, and we read an article from them. And I've got one for you this week that comes from one of the great writers, Masonic writers that we have uh, covered here in the past. And this is Kristen Wilson Slack. Uh, She's done a great deal of service to the craft. And she's also contributed to the book, How to Charter a Lodge, a no-nonsense, unsanctioned guide. We'll put a link in the show notes to that. But I wanted to read this cool piece that she wrote back in 2017 in September called Know Thyself, The Ship of Thieves. Now, know thyself, there's uh, quite a bit of interest about the uh, quote itself, uh, what it means. Does it mean, you know, you're a god? Does it mean know your place? Does it, you know, what does it mean? But those things aside, let's check out what she wrote. Quote, I am not the person I was, end quote. We hear that a lot, especially when it comes to growing older and, one hopes, wiser. Indeed, we are not the same person we were. Over the course of time, our cells die, regenerate, add, delete, change, morph, and eventually, we have all new cells. But we retain our name, our memories, our lives. Are we not the same person? One would argue that, of course, we are. Or are we? Really? We cling to our identities like dryer sheets to hot cotton shirts. In our minds, we are who we always have been. We are the 12-year-old child who swam in the lake, as well as that adult who had their first job in fast food. We remember events, creations, or possessions and claim them to be ours. Conversely, we claim our self to exist because of those things. We do not change, or if we do, it is at a glacial pace. We affix our identity in time and space, and like an astronaut, place a flag on it and proclaim it to be ours, to be true identity, knowing who we are. In a recent conversation with a fellow Mason, I was discussing the ship of Theseus. The paradox is quickly explained in a video that I'll link here. In essence, the question is this, at what point does the ship cease to become Theseus' ship and become something else? If we take one plank from the ship and replace it, we generally can agree that the ship is still Theseus' ship. At what point, however, do you fix enough broken pieces that the ship becomes something else? My colleague was convinced that the ship remained and always remained Theseus's ship. For him, the idea of identity stays with the generally recognized thing, even if the sum of its parts is not original. Conversely, the argument is this. If I am a thief and I slowly steal the pieces of Theseus's ship, replace them with identical parts, Take the original parts and put them together in my backyard. Who has the ship of Theseus? The original owner? Or me? My friend said that the original owner did. I disagree. If I take a painting from the Louvre and replace it with an identical painting, and everyone recognizes it as the painting, who has the real painting? In my colleague's eyes, then have I really stolen anything? I contend that I have. If nothing else, I have stolen the certainty of the ship of Theseus. I have stolen, or potentially stolen, the idea of the ship. But these painful musings do have a purpose. They help us work out our identity. The answer to the question of, who am I? A brilliant article on this is found on Brain Pickings. A link will follow. 
I would encourage you to watch the other short videos on the site. Not only is the one on Who Am I? thought-provoking, but there are links to life's other huge questions. How do I know I exist? What is the nature of reality? But I digress. The question is at what point is our self no longer us? Is it when all the cells in our body have been replaced? What about new neural pathways or brain cells? If we replace a leg or an arm or heart, are we the same person? Freemasons live by an adage of know thyself, which also adorned the Oracle of Delphi at the Temple of Apollo. We must first understand what it is that makes up our self. And when does that self become something else? I think this is a lifelong exploration, and since the self is constantly undergoing change, are we always who we were? Perhaps not. But then, where did we go? Does our identity persist? If it does so, how? What makes us, us? I asked my fellow Mason about clones, which sent us down an entirely different path, discussing identical twins and the like. Does time make a difference? If a plank is rotten on Theseus' ship and it is replaced, does that make identity linger as opposed to replacing a new plank? If I change my mind about how I feel about something, am I still the same person? What if I create new habits? What then? We are ever seeking to understand our true natures, yet our true nature is ever changing. Freemasonry teaches us about the cycles of life, death, rebirth in nature, and science. It teaches us all of life's mysteries. If stagnation is death and changes life, how can we ever be the same person moment to moment? Perhaps that is the mystery that we must ever follow. A constant, persistent discovery of who we are and what we are doing. Kristen Wilson Slack So that's our Craftsman Plus question. At what point do you stop being you or the original you? I look forward to hearing your replies. Now, let's get in to a little bit of fun stuff. Over the last few weeks, we took a little break about the tarot, but we're getting back into it. And uh, I received a lot of great feedback about the tarot. This week, we're going to be using a tarot deck called the Magic Gate Tarot. I received this tarot deck uh, as a gift from my good friend Wayne out in Australia. Big thanks to you. I love this deck. It is so cool. The symbolism on it is awesome. It really speaks to me. So thank you so much. But I wanted to share uh, this tarot deck with you all by, we'll do a random one card draw as we have been doing. Now, for those out there that are like, oh, what, 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 what does tarot have to do with anything? As I have said in the past, that we are not using tarot to be divinatory or for astrology or cardomancy or anything else. We are simply going to pull the card, look at the assigned meaning, and see what that has to do with anything that might be going on in our lives today. And sometimes it does, and sometimes it might not. But more often times than not, you'll be able to apply a question or something that it equates to on the card to our own lives. And uh, that's really nobody's business but your own. But we look at it in that way, and it helps us kind of contemplate our next move in life. Anyway, just giving these a quick shuffle, I think I did mention in our latest TikTok, you know, that I'd be using the Magic Gate Tarot. Uh, I like this deck because at 78 cards, the cards are like a premium card. They're glossed, and you can actually just split the deck down the middle because of the weight of the paper, and they're flexible enough to actually shuffle the entire deck in one... In, in one go. You don't have to be Andre the Giant. Usually I end up having to split a deck into two piles and then shuffle each and then shuffle those. Uh, not this time. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and flip over the top card and see what we get. Okay, I got the King of Wands. Interesting card. I don't think we've got that one before. I'll post a picture of the card in the Craftsman Plus group, so if you're interested in that, Check out the Support the Show on WCYPodcast.com to learn how you can get into that group. However, uh, this is an inverted King of Wands. 
So let's look at what the card means. I'm not one, I'm not much for one that is for the inverted, as we've talked about in the past, but uh, we'll cover what it means anyway with the AE weight translations. So in the upright position, and there's a reversed, right? So we're looking at what it could mean up or if you draw it upside down. Uh, we drew it reversed or upside down. So this could mean impulsiveness, hate, ruthless, high expectations, but not necessarily. If the card were upright, and in Paul Case's interpretation, most of the keys, all of them, actually, we don't use inversions. The card means what it means regardless of whether it's face up or face down. So this normally would mean natural born leader, a vision, an entrepreneur, or an honor. Typically, the King of Wands is depicted as sitting on a throne holding a stick with leaves on it. This is the original wand, if you will. In some cases, you might see a tarot card that refers to wands as rods. That also happens. The, the key, though, is that it, with... I shouldn't say the key. That might be confusing because the tarot cards are usually put in keys. Typically, the King of Wands, as he's holding the wand or the rod, it's blossoming. In this case, for this particular tarot deck, you know, it's a little bit darker, right? He does have the rod, but it is shining with a crystal on top, so it's invoking something. It's creating something. And usually in the left hand is a flame. Now, on this particular card, out of his left hand, I'm sorry, out of his right hand, he is holding a flower, manifesting a flower. The cape that the king wears in this is decorated with lions and salamanders. The salamander is a symbol of fire, right? Um, if you have been forced to watch the movie Frozen or Frozen 2 a bazillion times, like me, uh, you, they do allude to the salamander and fire even there. The lion is a symbol of strength, hence the uh, one of the keys in the tarot that deals with this. The salamanders are usually depicted as biting their own tails, right? So this is the Ouroboros type symbology and represents infinity or even just perpetual motion moving forward and not really worrying about the obstacles or if there are obstacles in your way, you overcome them. Let's talk about what the card likely means in an upright sense because I think this is more important and then we'll talk about some slight nuances with the reversed. So if the King of Wands is upright, this is like a masculine fire energy, right? Due to the salamander. Whereas a lot of the Wands cards deal with this idea of manifestation and creating. This one is not so much in tune with those things, but rather this could be some sort of a sign that you need to direct other people in in the creative process. So maybe you're doing something at work and you're a marketing manager or maybe you're thinking about how best to implement something at work. This is like telling you to think about your ability to be a leader and help actualize whatever the ideas that have been brought forth or kind of manifested to move them into completion. It helps you corral others around the vision and to make it happen. Also, because the king is thought to be on a throne, he's elevated, we're looking at vision, long-term vision, right? Looking out over the expanse. And so this might be also telling you that as you think about how you are supposed to guide these projects or these things that you're heading up, you'll be thinking about them in the long-term way. And even it may be leaving a legacy behind for future generations. And I think lastly, something that this could mean for you is that perhaps an opportunity is putting itself on your plate. And you could take this as a personal challenge to take on something new. Now, for our Freemasons out there, this could be maybe somebody has asked you to do the lecture. You're thinking, I don't know if I have it in me to do this. Well, this particular card might say to you, you have the power 
to take on this challenge. In fact, you may even be a deciding factor in the next degree if it's going to be amazing or laissez-faire. But also, because it's the King of Wands, it allows you maybe the ability to uh, share the burden. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of the nuances of the reversed card. So let's just assume you're already in some sort of a position of leadership, but maybe you weren't totally ready for that. You might be the person who dreams up everything, but you might not be the person to lead the project forward. This can be really difficult, like in particular, if you are somebody who, if you're like an ENTJ in uh, the Briggs Myers thing, right? I'm an ENTJ, and this means that I am pretty ruthless with something comes into my head, I wanna create it, I wanna do it, I wanna put it out there. I wanna get it done. And I might be the only person to be able to do that really fast. But also at the same time, it tells me to remember that I might not be the best person to lead the project. I just might be uh, the idea man. Something else this card does in an inverse way, it asks us to check ourselves. Maybe we are the leader of a project or we're going to be and help direct something, but are we being too aggressive or arrogant? Are we overstepping our bounds by demanding things of other people? Are we being too critical? These are introspective questions that we really should ask ourselves. And perhaps one more thing to think about as a nuanced approach to the card if it was inversed or upside down. Keep in mind realistic expectations. That means if there are things that you want to happen, but they may be far-fetched, let's be real. I'm reminded of something one of my old managers used to tell me. He said, under promise, over deliver. So <laughs> set a realistic expectation and then blow them out of the water if you move past it. So for our Craftsman Plus out there, I would, I would like to ask, let's just look at the King of Wands in the standard way. I'm not gonna ask about nuances when it comes to being reversed. Tell us about the last time you headed up a project that you were really proud of. In particular, when you directed a team of individuals who just crushed it, they did amazing. Now that's it for this week. I want to thank you all for joining us on this edifying episode of the show. Again, I'll post everything in the Craftsman Plus Facebook group that we talked about, as well as in the show notes. You can find everything there. I want to thank you all for following on TikTok and on Facebook and Twitter and all these other places. The TikTok thing is, uh, I'm getting a lot of great feedback about kind of the behind the scenes that we're doing a lot of the times. So I appreciate that. And it's fun to be able to uh, show you guys a little bit of what I'm doing in my office and just what's going on in my day to day with Freemasonry. So I uh, really appreciate all that. If you want to learn about how to help support this program, continue to bring education, Masonic education that is, to the world, head on over to wcypodcast.com, click on support the show and see how you can help. Again, really appreciate everything, especially for those people, even if you're not like some financial contributor, even if you're somebody out there who is constantly sharing the show and showing it to people at your lodge and all these things. This is really important because uh, it legitimizes Masonic education. And in particular, people come to a legitimate place for Masonic education that we don't have to worry about uh, weirdness that happens, you know, in some off channel, weird blacklisted channel on YouTube where some guys talking about conspiracy theories. So with all that, um, oh, one last thing, I will just mention that uh, brother Darren Laners and I actually had a great conversation with another brother and his co-host on his podcast, GhostNet Paranormal, the podcast. Uh, we had a great time talking about the cult fascination of Freemasonry that the general public has with us and I think Darren and I did a pretty good job of dispelling stupid rumors and myths about uh, Masonic uh, information. So uh, if you're interested, we'll throw a link to the show in the show notes also. And that's it. So until next week, stay in the level. For Whence Came You, 
I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.